Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we ask you now to open our hearts to your word as uh, we begin a new series this morning uh, on our families, on our lives, our, our marriages, our relationships with our parents, that you would just open our hearts to your word, help us to apply it, help us to be willing to listen to what you say. And we thank you now in Jesus' name, amen. Today we begin a family series called Removing the Chaos and Clutter. We're going to look at topics that are needed for a healthy family life. No matter if you're a spouse, a, a parent, a child, a sibling, I think that's all of us, right? We're all one of those things. In fact, if outside of the family each of these items we're going to speak about is needed as well. So don't feel it won't apply to you. Uh, rather, I would ask you to go into these messages asking God to show you how to apply them into your life. As 21st century Christians, uh, we have some unique things in our lives that are causing chaos. The blessings of America are wonderful, but they've also filled our, our homes and our lives with clutter. And if we're not careful, we become a generation who are self-serving. Me monsters, I like that term. Everything about us. Now, every generation throughout every age has dealt with some type of chaos in their life. So the key is diagnosing the cure within the setting of our generation. As your pastor, I am burdened for your marriages and I am burdened for your families. I pray for your marriages, I pray for your children. Uh, I am praying for health, and I am praying for wisdom in your relationships and in your decisions. So I want to share with you what God has for us as Christians and as Christian homes. And as we begin this series, I want to start with what I believe is the first step for a Christian home. No, no matter what member you are in the family, I believe this is the first step in a Christian home. And that first step is sacrifice. Now, I am taking for granted love. Love is already assumed in that family. And if it's not, that is the first step. We have to have love for each other. But the first step outside of that is sacrifice. Now, we've seen it over and over again as we've been reading through the Word of God uh, this year, and now we find ourselves, we're in 2 Samuel, and uh, as we've read through the Word of God in our daily Bible reading, we've seen people that have sacrificed for their family. Uh, you look at Noah as a father, and he sacrificed over half of his life. Yes, God instructed him to do that, but he, he sacrificed half of his life to save his family. We move to Joseph, the ultimate example as a son and as a brother, as he sacrificed over half of his life to save his family. In fact, he tells them that when they're, when they're fearful at the end. He says, no, 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 God meant this for good. And he sacrificed and was willing to do that. We get into the book of Judges and we see Gideon's father. Gideon went out and he ripped down the, the, uh, the tower for Ashtaroth and Baal and they wanted to kill him in the, in the neighborhood. And his father steps up and sacrifices to protect his son. David as a son, uh, he uh, is about ready to, uh, well, he thinks he might get discovered by King Saul at any time. And he takes the time and he protects his parents. And he sacrifices his own life so his parents could be taken over into Moab to be, to be protected. As he's wandering around in the wilderness there, trying to stay away from King Saul, we, we meet this lady named Abigail. And her husband Nabal is just a fool. In fact, his name means that. And this man, uh, he is, he's about ready, he puts their family in jeopardy. And she sacrifices as a wife and as sort of the household boss to protect her husband and her home. And she, she kneels down and presents herself in front of David before they destroy David then as he becomes king, he's, he's made some mistakes and the, the last sin that he has in counting the people and God sends this plague on the nation and, and he gets between the plague and he offers himself a sacrifice to save his people from his sin. Now, these are all very large gestures of sacrifice. And probably none of us will need to make that large of a sacrifice in our life. If so, it would be a one-time thing. But I'm talking about the day-to-day -day mindset of sacrifice. 
That mindset in our walk with, in our lives toward each other. Now, we're going to explain this through the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Turn your Bibles to the book of Philippians. You've been in the Word of God for any amount of time. These will not be new to you. But Paul shows us how to remove some chaos from our lives using Jesus' example. Philippians chapter 2, we'll start reading in verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and it took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. We find ourselves here, Paul talking to, he is talking here to the church family, but I would think as we look at this, how much more this should be applicable to our, to our physical family as well. So how do we remove, how do we start to remove chaos in our families? The first thing is don't look around. Start looking at yourself. Look at ourselves first. We cannot change others in our family. Even parents, we've realized we cannot change our children, right? And children, you know you're not going to change mom and dad. But who can we control? Who? Ourselves. Right, we can control ourselves. So there's three parts to this I want us to see. The first is this, submit, or better word would be surrender. Now, what, what am I talking about there? I'm not talking about parents surrendering to the demands of their children or surrendering to the demands of our family. We're not to turn over to everyone wishes and to make ourselves a doormat. But verses 5 and 6 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So our first step here is, let this mind be in you. What mind? The mind of Jesus Christ. His attitude. Our outlook determines our outcome. Our outlook determines our outcome. And when our outlook is selfish, the outcome is destructive and divisive in our homes. When we're always out for ourselves, our, our spouse or our kids lose security in us. Right? When it's all about me, our our spouse, our children, they lose the security of knowing we're there for them. The parents and the siblings lose trust in you. When our outlook is humble and our out, the outcome is loving, and unity starts to be built in the home. We trust each other. We start to gain confidence and security, which then frees us to start to grow in our faith, and it, we can serve then each other without fear. Now, verse 6 tells us the form of God. We're supposed to have this mindset, but in the form of God. The outward expression of the inward nature. When Jesus when talks about the form of God, He's talking about the outward expression of the inward nature. Jesus' nature was and is that of God. Why? Because He is God, right? So it wasn't robbery because He is equal with God the Father. Now, this is important. Stay with me on this. We know that He is God the Son, but if we go back then to verse 5, we know He is God, but we're to have His mind and His attitude. So the point here is Jesus needed nothing. He had His glory. He had His majesty. He had His praise. He had a perfect communion and love within the Trinity. Yet, yet, he didn't consider his position or his privilege something selfishly to hold on to. This is the key. Jesus didn't think of himself, but of others. 
So to get this, to have the mind of Christ means I can't have my privileges for myself, but I must use them for others. Each and, of us, each and every one of us have this. And we must surrender our privilege. Now, there are a lot of folks that can handle responsibilities. And we train our children to, to gain and to build up to where they're a responsible person. You know, we get to work and people that are responsible for budgets and personnel. But can we handle privilege? That's different than responsibility. We will either use our privilege to help others or to promote ourselves. Now note, by privilege, please understand this definition. I'm not talking about the guilt that people are peddling on college campuses and in the news due to our ethnicity or our upbringing. I'm not talking about that. I'm referring to privileges that give us choices and give us the means that we have that we can use to help other people, use to help our spouse, our child, our siblings, yeah, our siblings, ah. or others, and bring that bring glory to the Lord instead of bringing glory to us. Let me give some examples. Dads that are here today, I don't care how old your kids are. I don't care if they're up in the nursery or they're 50 years old. Use your strength and experience to help and teach your kids we have privileges. We can spend all of our time on our hobbies and on our pursuits. Drop the pride and build your children up with your words instead of tearing them down. Surrender the pride. It's hard to do sometimes. We almost feel threatened when our child starts to grow. Surrender that pride. Husbands, you're probably stronger than your wife. Maybe you're not, I don't know. But you're probably stronger than your wife. Leanne can throw a good punch in the arm, I tell you. But, <laughs> but you can use your strength to make your wife secure or for her to be scared of your next reaction. Wives, you're probably quicker to pick up emotionally on what's going on around you. You're a team. You're not his mom. And try to help him out by, without demeaning him. Surrender that privilege of knowing what's going on and, and allow yourself to build up your husband. Mom, your, your experience, your abilities are far more developed than your kids. They should be. You're older. Help them see the needs. Surrender the need to beat them over the head with their mistakes. I'm not saying don't correct your kids because they need that sometimes. But are you building them up into what and who you want them to be as adults? Surrender that. Surrender that privilege. When we talk about privilege, I, I sort of think of this past study that we just finished with the angelic beings. And remember when we consider Satan? The, he's the ultimate example of this. The most beautiful, highly positioned of the angelic beings. Yet he used his privilege to say, I will, I will, five times, I will, I will for self-promotion. Versus our Lord and Savior. Where instead of I will, he used his privilege to say, Thy will be done to his heavenly Father. It's pride versus humility. And the way to begin removing chaos in the home starts with an attitude of surrendering our privilege. But that's an attitude. It then must move to an action. And that is to serve. We surrender, and then we have to serve. Now please stick with me. Some of you in here right now, you might feel that all you do is serve your family. And that might be true. You feel like they don't do anything to help themselves or to help you at all. Verse 7 tells us, But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. A change of attitude, surrendering, is great. But it must be followed up with action in our lives. We cannot just be talk, talk, talk. All right? I hear a lot of talk. I see a little bit of action. Uh, we're experts in knowing what things should be done when we're talking about it, but when it's time to get them 
done, then we're good at talking about how it won't work. And that's pretty much the definition of a politician, right? No action. Jesus Christ is the expert in actually getting the work done. Note at the end of the verse, the same word we saw uh, used in verse 6, He is in the form of a servant. In the form, he says in verse 6 there, it talked about being in the form of God. Now we see him taking on the form of a servant. Now remember, uh, the form means the outward form of the inward nature. The key here, Jesus isn't playing a role here. He's not pretending to be a servant. His very nature on earth was that of a servant. The creator of the world. He made himself of no reputation. He laid aside his royalty. Creation put on creation. He became flesh. And not just flesh, the body of a servant that died on the cross. The one who said, let us make man in our image after our likeness now came to earth. God, we see God made us with all of his attributes. The, the attributes of intellect and of emotion and will. But Adam, he marred that. He marred that image. And we are now controlled by our sinful nature. Not as God intended us. But when Christ came, we got to see exactly what that nature, what that, what that perfect nature was supposed to be. 1 Corinthians 15.22 says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive it is only through trusting in jesus christ that our image is remade to what god would have us to be we're saved by believing in jesus christ we know this right the perfect man his death burial and resurrection for our sin he became a servant for that main purpose well he wants us to be a servant as well this next step involves action Having Christ's mind of humility. Now, don't a- answer this out loud, but how many of you sometimes feel like a punching bag for your family? I'm guilty of doing that to my family, not treating them the way I should. I'm sure Leanne has felt that way, my mom, my, my kids at some point, and if we admit it, probably all of us have, have not treated our family like we should. And, and they felt like they're just never going to win. And in our lives, it is knowing ourselves and accepting ourselves, then yielding that to Christ's youth. Use, I'm sorry. And just as it was a choice to surrender our privilege, we also now have to choose to be a servant. Verse 7, the phrase says, Christ made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself of the privileges of Godhead to serve mankind. This is putting it into action. This is putting, it be, putting others before ourselves. You might be thinking, well, why in the world would I want to do that? Look what it cost Jesus Christ. Well, let's look. Let's consider our marriages. A marriage is a perfect example of this. When we, when we drop our attitude of entitlement to our spouse we, and choose rather to seek their best first, what happens? If they're seeking our best first, and we're seeking their best first, what is occurring there? Each spouse is looking out for each other, and our needs are being met out of love and out of true desire to build up our spouse. You think that's going to create some unity in your life? Without a doubt it is. So instead of guilt or manipulation or obligation and duty, we're meeting this now out of love and out of concern for our spouses. Dads, uh, I know that God has placed you in the home as the spiritual leader. That means you're to follow Christ's example. And His example isn't lording over us, is it? That's not how the Lord treats us. And we're supposed to be this way to our family, serving them. How do you see your position as dad? The one with the hammer? Or the one that is building and loving them? How about brothers and sisters? Do you see your sibling as a rival? An annoyance? Eh, sometimes, right? Okay. Sorry, Sherry, I don't mean that right now to you. 
When she was five, I did. <laughs> or someone to take care of, looking out for their best. If we go back up to verse 3, it's before giving this example of Jesus Christ, he says to the Philippians in the church, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. All of this was to be done so they could be like-minded, have one mind, have unity. Paul is, illustrates then, this then through Christ's example. It brings unity. It brings harmony. It brings joy in our marriages. Joy in our families. And, and even then, in the church body. It brings personal joy because we're not always worried about me, me, me. And we can look out to others. That brings joy. When it's all just not about me, and I'm looking out for others, I can, I can let go of that and let the rest of the family and others be helpful, be thinking of me. You say, now that all sounds good, Keith, but it really sounds like pie in the sky. You don't know my family. Well, that leads to the hardest step. Sacrifice. Surrender, serve, and sacrifice. Jesus took the ultimate step in verse 8. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, the ultimate sacrifice. We all know that there are a lot that are willing to serve as long as it doesn't cost them anything. Right? I'm willing to do that until it actually costs us. Here's the decision that each of us must make. Will I sacrifice when others in my life don't or won't? Will I sacrifice when others in my life don't or won't? It's risky. I'm not going to lie to you. It's risky. What if my spouse doesn't reciprocate and just lives like some narcissist expecting me to love them and to serve them without reciprocating it back to me? It's true. You may not always be treated with gratitude or uh, acknowledged for your actions. That's sacrifice. In fact, you might be ridiculed. You might even be misunderstood by your family or even taken advantage of while you're serving your friends and your family. I'm not building this up, am I? But there is an interesting truth that we find in the Word of God. Throughout Scripture, when someone is pushing themselves up, up, up with pride, that pride is always pushed down, down, down. But when someone is humble for Him, that humble servant is brought up. The path should be in our lives. The more we receive, the more we sacrifice, and we will see more of God's blessings. I challenge you to see if this is true. Do you want joy in your family life? Are your relationships crushing you? Try this recipe. Try surrendering your privilege. Enable so that you can be a servant. And being a, having a servant heart and the deeds that, that allow you to then sacrifice to accomplish what God would have us to do. And it results in this. It results in a heart and a mind that's focused off our problems. And we've given those and left them in God's hands. A life that is blessed by God. And God will honor His Word. Do we believe God will honor His Word? Do we believe God will honor His Word? Sometimes we have to step out in faith. We say that. This is where the action comes in. Now, I am not promising your family is going to turn around in days or even weeks, but God will honor those who honor His Word. I have watched families apply God's Word and see improvement and see loss. In each case, those following God felt His presence though and experienced peace in their life. I've watched spouses that had bums as their spouse and that, when they, that would not... Surrender would not do anything like that. And they decided, I'm going to surrender, I'm going to serve, and I'm going to sacrifice. And yes, they had the hurt of rejection, 
but they also tell me they have peace in their life knowing that God is honoring them and watching over them and blessing their life. I've seen many follow God and I've watched how their heart was the hearts of their family were melted. The heart of their parent, the heart of their child, the heart of their spouse. I want to give you a first hand example. I had the opportunity to watch this. In 1989, my wife Leanne started attending Friendship Baptist Church. Margot Manger and Tanya Copley invited her to church their senior year of high school. And they started coming here to church. And Leanne accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. She was in her senior year of high school and was the last of the three girls uh, at home with her parents, Ray and Mary Brown. Terry had been married and she was out for a while. Her other sister, Tracy, was out of the house as well. Ray and Mary were good people. Moral people. They loved their family, but God had no place in their life. Not even a consideration. And after Leanne was saved, her life quickly began to change. She was serving the Lord. She was developing her faith. She had a new set of Christian friends. She was involved in the youth ministry here. And Ray began to lightly mock Leanne. She'd leave for church. Say a prayer for me today. Ha ha ha. This went on for over seven years. And over those years, I watched Leanne live out these principles. She surrendered her privilege and she served her parents. Even in whatever they asked. When she wanted to do some other things that here at the church and her parents needed her, that she would do those and she would honor them and she would sacrifice and honor them according to the Word of God. In that time, in her submitted, uh, as she submitted, yet deliberate, if you know my wife, she was deliberate in the way she used that privilege in her life. And she led her grandpa and her middle sister and her mom to the Lord. But Ray still was lost. And if you know Ray, you know why he was lost. He's honored as could be. Finally, her dad, Ray, accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now here's the part I want you to hear. Because his girls were so respectful and loving to him, his comment to Leanne was this, I felt you moving away from me. She was respectful, she was loving, she was sacrificing to him, but he saw her Christian life being lived he saw where he was in life, and he saw that gap growing as he was away from the Lord. And he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now, I can't promise that that's going to happen. And I say all that to give glory to God, but to show you a godly example of following Christ. I challenge you, each and every one of us, no matter if your family's all saved already, or if you're in a family where just you're the only person, I challenge you to put down your defenses, put down your privileges, and try Jesus' path to real joy. Not our pursuits, not our arrogances, because that just lends to emptiness. Surrender, serve, sacrifice. It will change the course of your family. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I don't know each and every family here, the situations. What we see on Sunday might not be what's happening the rest of the week. But you know. You know the struggles that some are having, the, heart, the hurts and the heartaches maybe within a marriage, between parents and, and children, between siblings. Prick our hearts, dear Heavenly Father. Help us to follow Your example. Help us to surrender. Help us to sacrifice to those around them. Dear Heavenly Father, there might be some here that don't know Christ and it starts there. 
We can't change without your power, without the Holy Spirit leading our lives. Help us, those that are lost, that come to know Christ now. In Jesus' name, amen.